Are you sitting in a space where you are struggling with anxiety? Do you feel like a prisoner to the cycles of depression? Do you feel stuck in your own life and feel frustrated and lost, but yet you know there is so much more on the other side of this mental breakdown? I want to hold your hand through this therapeutic life healing journey. I will help you navigate emotional healing, spiritual growth, and taking massive action so you can align your mind, body, and spirit to completely transforming your life. You are worthy of the life of your dreams, of stepping into your power and experiencing your breakdown as your breakthrough. Hey, I'm Adi. I'm your therapist, your coach, your mentor. Join me as we heal your life together. In episode 18, I'm going to be interviewing a dear friend of mine, Nicole Jackson, who also happens to be a psychotherapist out in Georgia. Nicole has been a helping professional since the year 2000. She is passionate about mental health, emotional well-being, and being an agent of change, particularly for adolescents, adults, and families of color. She's a licensed clinical social worker for the states of Georgia and California, providing trauma-informed counseling and coaching, workshops and training on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Nicole earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology from the University of Baltimore and a Master's of Clinical Social Work degree from the University of Maryland. She went on to receive extensive evidence-based training in complex trauma, adolescent care, and family work from the Seneca Institute for Advanced Practice in Northern California. Nicole has widespread experience working with diverse populations in an array of treatment settings. Her work is to transform the debilitating effects of multi-generational and cultural trauma into healing, living authentically and strengthened families and communities. True power lies in relationships, being seen and feeling valued. That is her work. I am so excited for y'all to meet my next guest on the podcast. She is a dear friend of mine. She also happens to be a mental health psychotherapist, Miss Nicole Jackson. She has been a therapist out in California and Georgia. She's all about healing, wellness, and being a light in this world for others. And we are so excited to have her. Hello, Miss Nicole. Hello, Adine. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I think every time I hear that introduction, I still get excited because I'm just like, I can't believe we're here. Like, we're really doing this, so... Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Nicole, I would love for folks to hear a little bit about you, your services, who you are. Can you share a little bit about yourself and your services with others? Sure. So Adit and I met back in the day when I was in California. Uh, Since then, I've transitioned to um, the Atlanta area in Georgia and here I work with teens and families and adults, and I provide trauma-informed psychotherapy and mental health services. And I'm still trying to have her move back to California, but that's just a side note. (laughs) (laughs) So, Nicole, you and I have been talking offline, and the topic today that we're discussing is Black liberation and through self-care as a means of a revolution for the Black and African community. And we even talked a little bit about how the acronym BIPOC, which is Black, Indigenous, People of Color. And I loved your perspective and thoughts on that. Can you share a little bit about how you view that acronym when you see it? Yeah, so again, right, like we talked about, like I said, this is only, I only speak from my own experience, right, as an African-American woman, a woman of African descent. Others have their own opinion and others have their own own freedom to identify how they see fit for them, right? So I'm only speaking from my experience. And for me, I am, I'm mindful and I'm careful of using that acronym because Oftentimes, our play and our stories, and that's of like Black and African American people, right? It gets reduced or it gets re- uh, devalued. And I never want that to happen, right? And in this country, we're so apt to label and group people together and use these acronyms, right? And that's to put a veil over our light and to take away from our experience. And 
what I want is for all of our narratives to be highlighted and celebrated, right? Like I wanted our narrative to be equally celebrated and highlighted, right? I don't want us just to be grouped together as this acronym and as this bunch, right? I want all of us to highlight both the strengths, the joys, the tragedies, the triumphs. I want us to learn from each other. So I am just really careful that I am always making sure that our story is seen and our stories are heard. I love that so much, Nicole, because after you had, we were talking about that, I saw also somewhere someone had written that the danger that comes with people of color also being a, it lumps everybody together kind of exactly in the same line that that you were saying. It lumps everyone's stories yeah. together. And, and the woman was saying, she's like, I'm an African-American woman. I have no idea what it is like to be a Korean woman. I have a different story. She has a different story. And so the importance of yeah. not lumping everybody's stories together and really having this, this right? Because we're yeah. all, we all have pride. We all have joy. We all have stories. We all have joys yeah. and sorrows in our cultural narratives. And the importance of kind of just taking a moment to pause and really point that out. So that was something I wanted listeners to hear because that was a learning for me in this recent time. So I hope that that also lends someone yeah. else this this moment of learning. So thank you for sharing that insight, Nicole. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, and I had to be, when I saw it, I had to come to grips with what that felt like to me, right? And like decide, okay, is that who I am? Do I want to be a part of this? What do I think about it? And that's just what feels good and what sits right with me. Yeah, after also looking at it, it, it sits right with me. I was at first, you know, I'm I'm like someone who I saw it. I was like, oh, that makes sense. And then when you kind of break it down, I'm like, oh, wait, that doesn't make sense. I mean, it, it makes sense that if you want to be quick and I almost take like the easy, the lazy route out and just put everything yeah. and everyone together, right? It's like the shortcut version, yeah. but it, it takes yeah. away. Which is what we do, right? Yeah. R- right. Exactly. It is, yeah. I feel like, rooted in white supremacy, too, right? There's a there's a way that it's like, oh, here's everybody from around the world <laughs> in four acronyms. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, how does that make sense? Do you, and that's what I'm saying. Like, do you know how many stories that is? Like, how rich our culture is if we all equally celebrated and highlighted our narratives and made space for each other? Doesn't it even sound crazy for us to talk about it? And like when you think about like how expansive we are and how we can be, right? But again, it's like the the trappings of white supremacy again is to just be like, okay, let me just snip off this narrative. Let me make everyone like divisive and everyone's plight is the same. Hell no. Hell no. No, thank you. And when I was looking, I was like, wait, where do I fit in? I'm not black. I'm not a person of color. I'm like, oh, I'm indigenous. Literally, Abe and I had a conversation. I was like, wait, we don't have, I'm a Syrian. We don't have the land. So I was like, oh, I fit in the indigenous category. But how crazy and how stupid that I even, you know, that we are, we are taught, right? If, If we didn't have that awareness, right? If I, didn't you know you actually really inspired me to look at that and be like oh wait why am i boxing myself in assyrians have an entire story all on their own about our genocide about our empire about the joys and sorrows and in the same way the black community the korean community the latin community and then they're trying to lump us all together in a bipoc no (laughs) <laughs> and just like go ahead over there go ahead over there everything's the same and it's again it's like the fragility of like i don't want to look at it i don't want to deal with it yep and it's like no we're, we're all here on this land and at this point we all have to deal with it and be with each other and be in community and enrich our fabric right and let's celebrate so, it no. let's celebrate it right it's no, exactly yeah. let's celebrate it so i know nicole also we talked yeah. a- about seeing color and i know in the past i am guilty of being someone who wanted again good intentions impact ma- matters and now i'm i'm of the of the thought that you need to actually start and work backwards from impact to intention 
It's not enough to have good intentions and yeah. then have a, you know, a repetitive I'm sorry impact. It's instead educate and be intentional about the impact first before you say something and work backwards. Absolutely. Right? Like staying in that. Exactly. And I'm guilty of being someone who has said in the past, I don't see color, right? Coming again from good intentions, wanting to be like, uh, I, you know, I love right. everybody. And, you know, but the impact of that yeah. is, oh, I, you're not seen. And in this time, I, you know, what are your thoughts when you hear that phrase? Because I think there's still a narrative out there back and forth between people saying, is it racist to say I, I see color? Is it not and now I'm, I land on you see color and celebrate it, honor it, love it. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so you know that when I first, because I'm originally from Baltimore, right? And so we're really clear on who we are in Baltimore, right? And what we see and what we don't see and what we talk about and what we don't talk about. Very straightforward. It's East Coast. So when I moved to California... <laughs> That was something that I heard oftentimes is that I don't see color, right? And it, it, and that's what it felt like to me, right? It's like, okay, so then that means you don't see me. And I get it in, in the sense because, again, I'm really intentional about language and who we are. So it's like, I want you to see culture. I want you to see my ethnicity. I want you to see my plight, and I want you to see my story, Right. And what got to me was where I felt like, okay, I have to say something. I have to speak out was because, you know, I work with families and I work with kids. And the same people that were saying these things were then responsible for caring for these young Black and African American children, right? And some of these homes were Caucasian and other, right? And so... I saw the impact and the outcome of what happens when someone says, I don't see color, but you send your young black boy out into a predominantly white neighborhood, right? And so I had to become really vocal on shifting that and reframing that and and bringing to the teens why we needed to see it, right? And then it dawned on me that we weren't even comfortable having these conversations together. So, oh my gosh, we're not having them with the families and the kids that we work with, right? I was, right? Because it matters to me and it's just my life and it's commonplace. But a lot of us at large were not. And so that is how I feel, right? When you don't acknowledge my ethnicity, when you don't acknowledge my culture, when you don't acknowledge the impact of the color of my skin in this country, then you're not seeing me, right? You're making me to be someone who you want me to be versus who I really am. And again, it came back to me around the white fragility of like, you know, oh, oh my God, you know, all of the franticness I would always get in in heaven, like those conversations. And then, like you said, we have to deal with, I understand that you're well-intended. I understand that your heart is in the right place, right? But here's the impact. And walking people all the way through what that impact could look like and what it could feel like. And I think that's when shifts started to happen. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, when you when I was talking to Abraham about it, we were having just the general con conversation like I identify as a woman, she, her pronouns, he identifies as a man, he, him pronouns. And he will never understand from a gender identified perspective what it is to be a he, her, a woman. And I will never understand what it is to be a he, him as a man. And so we were having this back and forth and he was, at, you know, he was kind of educating me on like, you know, that's in this parallel. It's not the same, but in this parallel process, that's what's happening when you don't see color, when you don't, you know, it's a lifelong, it's not a, it's not a topic that you, you, you know, take a course on and you're now an anti-racist and you have no more work to do. Like even me, I'm learning so much. It's like layers and layers, but it's because I'm not black. I don't know what it is to be a black person in this world, period. And so I don't have that story. I don't have that history. I don't, ha you know, I, but I want to celebrate it. And for me to see it 
it is the same way when you know yeah. listeners are listening it's the same way if you think about it in a parallel process between different genders you will never know what it is to be that person and the other gender and so you always have to educate yourself like i'll show a videos about you know catcalling for women and how it's it is you know it's such a degrading at times i have to be mindful of my safety what time of day it is i go out alone and and things i have to constantly think about as a woman where he doesn't as a man right man, man, man privilege so it's so yeah. important to see color and to celebrate it like you said see yeah. me see my story absolutely yeah absolutely absolutely that's a good point point. and nicole i know we were also talking about the importance of self-care i mean it, it's universally divine that this episode is being released on juneteenth i know that is such an important date for the black and African-American community where slavery ended or is abolished. And so the importance of self-care as an act of revolution for the black community. Can you go into depth about what that means for people who don't understand that? Yeah. So it is such a privilege, right, for me and an honor for me to, to be doing something like this with you, someone who I honor and care for so deeply on like Juneteenth, right? Like what an honor, right? Like that, that is just amazing. And it is just like amazingly divine to me. And I give honor to that. And I think about too, there's a parallel that it is disheartening that we're, we're, we're in this position that we're still fighting to tell other people that our lives matter, right? And we built this country literally, right? But our citizenship and our humanness is still being called into question, right? So, but what's happening today is definitely important because the culture is what makes change, right? The culture is what shifts policies and procedures and things like that, right? And there's some awesome activists. There's awesome people out there that are doing the work. There's awesome people that are al allying, right? So to be talking about self-care as, as an act of intervention and revolution on this day is so important to me because like we talked about, you know, capitalism was was born out of, you know, slavery, right? Like this country was born from our backs, right? From greed, from consumption of all, you know, slavery funded and financed the industrial revolution in England, right? So we literally built this country and everyone, you know, profited except for us, right? Like we were enslaved. Our culture was taken away. We were robbed from our families, right? And that's very hard. And as James Baldwin said, you know, we became a country that's plagued by, you know, something called color. And, and that's still where we are. And the residuals still remain, right? Is that this idea that we have to work tire tirelessly, right? We have to work so hard in order to earn. We have to consume. We have to take time away from our loved ones for, you know, jobs that we pay and different things like that. And for, for many, it is a necessity and it is, you know, something of survival, right? So I'm not just saying this willy nilly because I get it and I understand it, but that narrative is not true, right? Because we as African-American black people, we work really hard. We built the damn country and we are still fighting to tell people our lives matter. That is fucking ridiculous to me, right? So for us to willfully say no, right? For us to willfully slow down and say, I'm not gonna participate in a system that is meant to bring me down, right? That's meant to rise off of my labor and to take me away from my family is such an act of revolution, right? It's also an act of gratitude. In an, in an act of giving honor to our ancestors because they didn't have the opportunity to rest and to slow down, right? We do. We get the opportunity to go within and to really have some resolve with 
how are we going to do this, right? How are we going to stay in this fight? How are we going to continue to show up for ourselves and for our families and for our communities at our best capacity? So, so to do that and to talk about that on this day, it is so pivotal to me because I want us all to get it. I want us all to understand how vital caring for ourselves is, right? Audre Lorde talks about, and like I said, I'm not, I'm not anyone that's like pioneering this, right? I get this from the four mothers that did this before me. And Audre Lorde talks about it's a matter of political warfare right now. It's a, it's a, a matter of self-preservation. So that's where we're at. Like, that's how important it is. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely connected to generational healing. And being able to say your rest matters, your self-care matters as part of black liberation and that being something rooted in history where when black and African-Americans were enslaved here in America, your worthiness was based on your work and uh, prescribed by your white slave owner. And so to be here yeah. today and say, fuck that, I am in, I am more than enough and my self-worth is not tied to what I do, but it's who I am, the, pro- the black joy, right. the kings and queens and the emperors that I come from, that lineage is still here, yeah. present with me in my bones and my blood today and I'm celebrating that so I will rest. I will self-care. I will take yeah. that massage. Yes, thank you. I will take that day off. And no yeah. HR, you don't get to tell me how I wear my hair. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, right? And to be, you know, to be on this land and to be born into this country, to be black or brown, right, that means daily trauma. It means daily insults for, for some of us, right? And when I think about the world that we live in for trans women and for cisgender women, right, and just like what you were talking about, what our experiences can be, and we can be, um, you know, objectified and fetishized and valued, it is absolutely necessary, right, for us to be able to know who we are for ourselves, right, for us to own our own narratives and who we are. It's really important because it helps us show up in the fullness of who we are, in the essence of who we are. Like you said, apart from any work or any job, right? But the essence of like who we are. And that's what this life is about. That's what I believe. That's what it's about. And when you tell your story and when you rest and you really kind of do do take the time to pause and allow your your worth to be connected to just your your ancestors and yourself and who your the future generations to come after you and that storytelling that resting turns into who you want to become and how that generational healing is passed down in the black and african-american community absolutely no because just like you were saying right like it changes our family tree yeah. Right. When when we're able to care for ourselves and we model for our young people how to do that. Right. When we model for them, you know, how to take ownership of your life and how to own your own narrative. Right. How to because that's what self-care gives you the ability to do is how to access choice. Right. So that whatever you go through in life, it can become a response versus a reaction. Right. And so to have that kind of ownership and empowerment of your life could be vital. Right. For some of us, it could be a matter of life and death. So you get to change your family tree. You get to heal and break generational curses just by caring for yourself. And I get it. And I give reverence to the people before us, because like I said before, like some of this was out of survival. Right. Some of it is out of necessity. And for us today, we still have to work. We still have to earn however we do. We still have to produce for ourselves and for our families. But what I'm what I'm asking people to do, what I'm offering them to do is to look at how you do everything. Right. How do you infuse joy? 
into everything that you do, right? How do you make your life a ritual so that you can always show up in your authenticity no matter what, right? So that the outside forces don't control you, but you have choice and in, in dominion as much as you can over it. I mean, right now, I hope anyone listening, taking notes and just <laughs> such a learning moment for myself. You know, I think about, I love the people in my life. I have in my family, my friends who identify as Black and African American. And I want to support the rest, your rest. And so for anyone listening who's white, white passing, ask or just do and support those that you are that, ha- that are in your life that are black or African American community right now. Ask how you can support their rest. Ask how you can be part of their self care. And maybe don't even ask, but just do. Send flowers. <laughs> Send love. Uh, yeah. You know, so celebrate you that. <laughs> right. It's like another way to say, I see you. It's like, I see you. Yeah, I want your rest. I want, I want to share with your listeners that, like, you are a just doer. Adeep sent me money a couple of weeks ago when things were really tough and really hard. She says, friend, I just want you to have dinner on me, right? And that was such a beautiful thing because it was Sunday, which is totally like self-care day. And I tried to give the money back and all of this stuff. And you were like, uh-uh, that's not even happening. Just chill out. And it was such, I cried because it was such a beautiful gesture. And it was me like feeling your friendship and your energy all the way from Callie. And I was like, that's just who she is. She gets on my nerves, but I love her so much. (laughs) You did not want to like me. You did not. (laughs) You love me. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't. I was hell-bent. I was like, oh, no, I'm not going to like her. And look at at us. Look at us now. See what I'm saying, though, like how we would have missed each other had we just not been interested and curious about each other. Had you not just been like, <laughs> no, who are you? <laughs> Let's take a nature walk. <laughs> I love you so much. I have learned so much from you. I admire and respect your work and I admire and respect just who you are as a person in this world. And as in as a human who wants to be a better human, I looked at you as as that. I'm like, wow, this this woman is incredible. I, I want to continue to build a relationship with her and know her story. That's what's beautiful is like to be able to see each other and get to know each other's story, history. We're all di- different and we come from different walks of life. But when you know something is going on right now in Racism is not new in America, period. Absolutely. And right now to really be there for your friends who are impacted directly, right? It's a a re-traumatizing experience. It's like you said, it's constantly daily for someone who's black and African-American. We're in America, but I imagine all around the world because there's protests happening all around the world, which is beautiful to witness. Isn't that amazing? Right. It's so amazing. You are constantly, as a Black and African American person, thinking about your safety daily. And so to rest and to have self-care is such an act of revolution. Absolutely. Yeah, to say no, right? To say, I'm not going to do this. To say, I matter. My rest matters. My life matters, right? That is definitely such. And, you know, to be able to radically occupy our bodies and you know, the space, it changes and it, you know, and it transforms. And for a lot of, you know, African-American people, we're not often taught how to care for ourselves, right? We're not often taught how, how do we channel the anger? How do we effectively channel the anger, right? So to do this, you could feel vulnerable, Right. And to be vulnerable, we can't always afford to be vulnerable. Right. Look at what's going on. And so it can feel counterintuitive to do. But it's so imperative, you know, particularly for people of African-American descent. Right. Particularly right now when we're going through 
a social movement where there are people that are on the ground. There's people doing all types of activism, right? Like I'm not going to take anything away from any of us that are in it that's doing it, right? Allyship, activism, it is imperative that we take the time, right? It is imperative because we have a responsibility, right? We all have a gift. We all have a role in this and we all have a link. And if we're not able to know what is that, what are our gifts? What is our responsibility? What is the lane? Then it'll be chaos. It'll be chaos. And we will come at this from a place of exhaustion. Like imagine, like, you know how it feels when you show up to an event or to an activity, right? Um, something that you have to do and you're well rested and you just feel good and that energy is good, right? You're approaching it with joy and enthusiasm. This is, it is hard work. And so everything that we do, what if we approached it? What if we could access just our inner peace and our inner joy and enthusiasm? What about that energy and that energy that we would bring to this movement right now? Hmm. Because it's really heavy. You know, this is our everyday life. Like I said, ever since I was, like ever since I could remember, it, it lives with me. It's who I am. I don't have the privilege of turning it off. Right. Like and now I live in a state where one of the only states that we have no hate crime law. Right. Like it's amazing to me. It's mind boggling to me that this is like 2020 and these are things that are still happening and it affects me. Right. You feel it. You know, because that to me, that's my safety. That means I have to be careful. You know, like I said, the young man, Mr. Aubrey, that that died. I have to I take walks, right? Like in different neighborhoods. I, you know, I'm new here, so I do wrong turns and all of that stuff. But I am so mindful of that now because I don't want to go on anybody's property. I don't want to do any of that. So to live like that, we have to, it is so imperative, right? in order for us to step out the narrative that's been given to us, in order for us to know the light and the truth of who we are, we have to take that time to nurture ourselves. We have to take that time to instill that value in ourselves so that we can show up able and ready and capable for ourselves and for our families and for our communities. Self-care is literally what can transform trauma. It is literally one of the interventions that is evidence-based in transforming trauma. Mm -hmm. So it's, this is not just like a woo-woo thing that we're talking about here. Like it's really real. It's life and death. Like that's what you are. We're talking about. Nicole, what are some ways that you, or the way that you talk to your clients to take self-care? What does that look like? So I am. Um, I'm very intentional about it, right? Like it's it's the very starting point of my work with anyone because the majority of my clientele is African-American women and they're being pulled in so many different directions and so many expectations and there's so many stereotypes and, you know, they're mothers and they're facing microaggressions, right? And they're just in it. They're just in it. They're doing it. I honor them. And it's hard. So it is my very starting point, right? Because I feel like it validates the necessity of being intentional and purposeful for caring for yourself. It's it's what I do. It's one of the very first interventions. It's like, okay, let's look at every area of your life and where can we call about time for your joy? What replenishes you? Right? Like how are you eating? How are you sleeping? How are you just caring for your body? How are you just showing up for yourselves? So it's one of the very first things that we do oftentimes. Wow, that's so powerful. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Because we're in a time right now, right? We're called to examine every aspect of our lives right now, right? Like, and for... What is happening right now, a lot of African-American and black people are saying, no, I'm going to alter 
these repressive circumstances and conditions, right? These things that are holding me down, these things that are holding me back from being my best self and living my most authentic life, I need to alter that. And in order to know how to do it and to access how to do it, you have to slow down, first of all, to even know that there's repression, to even know that there's hurt, there's pain, right? That there's something that needs to be changed. And you mentioned earlier too, Nicole, about Black joy, how important that is as part of self-care too, and honoring and celebrating the stories and the history of the Black and African-American descent and ancestors and kings and queens and emperors and how that, starting with that narrative, if you're Black and African-American, to really be able to celebrate the Black joy that you also have. Yeah. And what I, what I would want people to do is consider what if every decision was based from a point of joy, from a space of your joy, right? What if your joy was always accessible to you every day? Be it through dance, be it through touch, be it through connecting with your family, right? Whatever that is for you. But what if that was prominent in your life? What would that look like? How would your life look different? How would that shift perspectives? How would that shift how you show up for yourself? What if you took that narrative as opposed to one of trauma, of hurt, of the pain? And I'm not saying deny it because it is there, but what if you invite that joy in, right? Oftentimes when we do that, that will manifest. Right? Joy begets joy. And so what if that was the starting point of your actions, your decisions, how you approached yourself, Mm -hmm. right? The thoughts that you gave to yourself, the things that you chose to engage in. What if you were really intentional about how you spent your time and your money and, you know, what you did? to make sure that it only brought you joy. Gosh. Right. From a mental health perspective, <laughs> we would say that that increases your lifespan, right? Your longevity. Yeah. It reduces stress. What does stress in the body do? It increases high blood pressure. Anxiety is a side effect. All of that. So when you invite that in, it's, it's you're really actively, you're expanding your, you're decreasing your stress and expanding your lifespan and yeah. passing down the, the, the chemical changes in the body to future generations for the healing to take place. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. I remember I met this older woman, an older African-American once. We were in a training, but she was so beautiful, Adi. Like, I could tell she was an older woman, but her skin was glowing. She just had joy. She was driving like this red convertible something. And I just was like, I want to know who she is and what she is doing. And I literally asked her and she said, oh, honey, she said, I live my life as self-care. And that blew my mind. It blew my mind. And I was like, how do you, how do you do that? What do you do? What, like, I was dumbfounded. And that's what she said. She said, I start from a place of joy. And that's where I make my decisions from. Wow. And I, I needless to say, I, I was blown away, right? Like, she blew me away because her aura and everything, I was just like, I want to be her. Like, that's <laughs> that's it. And when she told me that, I was just like, the li- like the little thing. Like, I make as ritual as me making a cup of coffee every day. I use my favorite mug, right? Like, I buy my favorite coffee. I slow down. I smell the coffee. Like, I'm in each moment, right? So it's just small things, simple ways. But, yeah, it, that blew my mind when I met that woman. She she taught me, and I was like, okay. <laughs> I clearly saw the, the impact. She was walking, living the impact of self-care. Oof. She was at that training as a had been as a had been thing. It was like I just want to be here, right? Like I'm learning. I was there because I needed to be. <laughs> <laughs> she was there by choice, and I was like, okay, girl, I see 
see you. I see you. I love what you said, Nicole, about just also just the the simple way of just smelling your coffee, slowing down, taking the time to rest. Absolutely. Have time for transition. Even if you have a busy day, I get it. Take five minutes to do a breathing exercise. Do a transition from one exercise to the next, from one activity to the next. Like, small ways. Take deep breaths throughout your day, right? Like, give gratitude and thanks all day for everything, Mm -hmm. right? Be in the present moment. So I'm not saying self-care is in these big, gigantic things where you need money and you need time. We're talking about slowing down and we're talking about resting. We're talking about being intentional and having empowerment over your own life, right? We're talking about being able to lean out so that you can stay in the good fight, as they call it, right? Mm -hmm. So how are you honoring yourselves and doing that? Because we're no good to our community if we are no good to ourselves. And oftentimes, how we treat others is a direct reflection on how we treat ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I can't treat you good if I'm not treating myself good. That quote at the end of your email it almost kind of, what you're saying sums it up. Can you repeat that one? I am because we are. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's an, it's an African, tri- uh, a, a African proverb, and that's just always how I felt, right? Like, you know, I honor connection. I love connection. I am, at, like, when I, I tell my clients when I, when I work with them, like, there's a bit of me in you, right? or we wouldn't be here in this time and space together, right? Like we're here for a reason together in this moment, right? I am, I I, I can't call myself a therapist if I don't have anyone that I work with, right? <laughs> I can't be a daughter if I don't have a mom, right? Like, so I don't, I don't live in silo and I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. You, you've always, that's what I admired about you so much. You have this, you have radical self-love, but you also have radical self-community love. Like it, relationships yeah. matter so much to you. And we all, like humans, that's how we thrive. Yeah. We are because we are who we are around, who we see. And so, Nicole, when you think about right now, if there's anyone listening, anything that wasn't said that's on your heart that you would want someone to have a takeaway what would that be Hmm. I want everyone to know that we all have power right we all have a light we all have a gift and self-care really helps you to align yourself, right? To allow to align your personality, your ego, to be in service to that gift, to be in service to your divine self, right? And so I I just want everyone to know, right? Like to take the time for yourself, because this is your life, right? Ultimately, this is your life. So if you're not taking time for yourself, then what are you doing? Right. Like I have to tell myself that sometimes because oftentimes I think I need to be writing and blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, this is my life. If I'm not taking time for myself, what am I doing? So I want everyone to know that you are worthy. You are valued. You are seen and you are enough. Right. So to say no and to really own who you are, own your life, own your narrative for yourself. First and foremost, right? If if you are not honoring yourself, you're no good to your family or to your community. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the last thing that I wanted to say was because I'm also loving the work of Girl Trek. So I wanted to shout them out and they're daughters of movement. And I want to give honor, especially, right? Because this is going to air on Juneteenth. And I, I am here off the shoulders of my mother and her mother and all the mothers and all the people that came for me. And so I can't sit here 
on this wonderful platform with you and act like, oh, this is just me, right? Like, I want to honor my mother. Right. And so Girl Trek has this uh, Daughters of Movement. And so I wanted to tell my daughter's of story. So I am Nicole. I'm the daughter of Rosenda, who is the daughter of Devon by birth and the daughter of Adelaide Marie by choice. And so without those women, I wouldn't. Right. Like they've helped to shape me and they've helped to shape my voice. And all that I do, so I do this in honor of them because of the work that they did for me. So that's it. And I cried uh-huh. again. <laughs> <laughs> Are there ever any not tears when when we talk, you and I? But I, 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 I honor and see your ancestors, your mom, your grandmother, you. your great grandmother, and and. This is such a special episode to be released on Juneteenth. Nicole, thank you for being here, for your time. I know people are falling in love with you because, I mean, hello. If you want to follow her work and amazing things that Nicole is doing out in the world, Nicole, where can people find you? Yeah, so my the, the catch-all to, to get me would be my social media, my IG. So I am at mahogany underscore rays. And that's M-A-H-O-G-A-N-Y underscore grace. So thank you. And I'll have that in the show notes. But you know, you also like that mahogany rays has such a deep, deep. We have to end with that. What does mahogany rays stand for? Where how'd you come up with that? So when I think of mahogany rays, right? You know, I love the sun. You know, I am ruled by the sun. And when you look at the wood of mahogany, when you look at the grain of it, it's one of the richest wood, right? It's one of the richest grains. But if you really look at it, it has all types of reddish colors in it. It has all types of brown and beautiful tan. And it's just gorgeous and it's just high quality and it's just luxury, right? And so my idea was like, Wow, it's so beautiful. And for me, that represented just the people and for me, like all the shades that make up my community, right? And so I was thinking like, wow, if a sun ray were to hit a mahogany tree, right? All of the different rays would just reflect like all of the different colors and all of the different like attributes and characteristics of the people that I love and that I want to create a healing space for. And so that's where Mahogany Rays came from. It's just an honor of the healing space in the community that I love and that I work with and that I want to continue to show up for. So find Nicole, y'all, on Instagram. I'll have her in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here, Nicole. It's such an honor and pleasure to have you and your time. I love you so, so much. Thank you for being here.